This is now officially our first Pure Health panel. Start off our week. So we have an hour here. I want to introduce myself. My name is Doug Judy. Uh, I'm a pediatrician and a public health professor at UC Berkeley and uh, have the honor of uh, convening this panel here. And I am the content leader for the health track here at SOCAP this year. And this first panel, uh, as we title The Changing Landscape of Health, what it means for investors and entrepreneurs, it's really an opportunity here to bring uh, several of the primary sponsors and uh, both thought leaders and uh, financial supporters within the health track uh, here on stage to hear, uh, to, to talk about what's going on in their institutions and in health in general. But first, uh, to start out, what we're going to do is uh, Risa Leviso More uh, is the CEO and president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We're going to provide her an opportunity to speak by video. She couldn't be here in person. So Reese has been uh, president uh, and CEO since 2003, so fully a decade at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And she's an interesting person because her background, she has an MBA from Wharton as well as an MD and is a practicing geriatrician. So the combination there uh, is, is really unique. So I think we'll tee up the welcome from Risa and then I'll introduce our panelists. SOCAP Health. I'm Risa Lavizo Mori, the President and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. First, let me just say thank you. Thank you for wanting to make a difference and for believing that change is not something that we should wait for, but something that we should be willing to and daring enough to create. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has spent 40 years believing that very same thing. As America's largest philanthropy dedicated solely to health issues, we've tackled tobacco, we've taken on childhood obesity, we've wrestled with the value, quality, and accessibility of health care, and we've done it because we know that the well-being of our society and the vitality of our economy depends on connecting purpose with action. In other words, we're your kind of people. I think I speak for everyone on this panel when I say that we're all eager to help you connect with the communities and the networks and the innovative thinkers on the front lines. In fact, we can't wait to help you. As you heard earlier, many of the serious health challenges our nation faces today have little to do with what happens inside a practitioner's office and have much more to do with the everyday aspects of people's lives. Persistent gaps in income, education, housing, neighborhood infrastructure are damaging the health of our people and the potential of our country. In far too many cases, the length and quality of a person's life has as much to do with zip code as it does with genetic code. These disparities are moral issues, but they're also economic issues. For example, when you introduce a grocery store into an urban food desert, you're not just improving health and providing healthy fare to families, you're also creating jobs, tax revenue, and community cohesion. It's all connected. We know it, and you know it. And at my foundation, we're working to create a national culture of health that enables all in our diverse society to lead healthy lives now and for generations to come. And we're doing it by bringing together agents of social change, arming them with evidence-based research, and then giving them room to innovate for the greater good. So we're thrilled to welcome you to that table. Let me leave you with the words of an African proverb. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. So let's get to work. We don't have any time to waste. Thank you for your attention. Have a great conference. <laughs> well, you can see why uh, we wanted her here, even though she couldn't actually be here. She's an amazing speaker and a, a real inspiration. 
So the goal today is to uh, talk a little bit about the changing landscape of health and healthcare uh, in the country and how that is affecting the institutions we see here up on stage and what the opportunities are going to be for innovation, entrepreneurship, and investment uh, going forward. So I want to just give a, uh, a quick introduction of each of our panelists. My plan is to ask each of them a question uh, once we've done introductions. They'll have like three, four, five minutes to give uh, some th their, th their initial thoughts. Then I've got a couple follow-up questions for the panel. Some may come up from the discussion. And that actually is going to take a good portion of our hour. So I want to make sure we leave about 15 minutes, if we can, at the end for questions from the audience. So be thinking about what you might uh, ask our panelists as, as we go through, OK? So first to my right is Jim Marks. Uh, Jim's at uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. He's going to be speaking on behalf of RISA. He's senior vice president and director of the health group. and. Uh, has been there since 2004, so a long time now. Uh, he retired previously, he was Assistant Gen Surgeon General after serving as the director for the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, not Community Development Corporation. <clears throat> uh, the Center for, uh, National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. Next to him, we have Carl Hoffman. Carl's actually a former ambassador to uh, Togo and has been at the PSI, uh, Population Services International, since 2007, and uh, brings our global perspective to our panel today. Next to him is uh, Tony Eiten. Uh, Tony is, uh, strikes me as potentially the person with the most letters behind his name as a, a doctor, a lawyer, and a public health professional. And he served as the director and county health office for Alameda County across the Bay uh, for a number of years before coming to the uh, California Endowment in 2009, where he's senior vice president for healthy communities. Uh, Kimberly Cornett is next. Uh, she is the director of social investment practice at the Kresge Foundation, which is based in Detroit. She's been there since 2009, and before that, she worked uh, for the Enterprise Community Investment uh, Company, working in real estate investment for affordable housing and community development. And last, we have David Erickson. David's at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. He runs the Center for Community Development Investment and is the editor of the Community Development Investment Review, uh, the journal there. And is unusual at the Fed because he's actually not an economist, he's a historian. So he brings a little bit of history uh, and economic perspective to, to our panel here. So with that, uh, we'll start with Jim. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> so the question I want to ask, oh. aha. <laughs> Let's see if this is the question you prepared for. We'll, see, we'll find out if he was paying attention on our call. Uh, so what do you see as the three biggest changes occurring in health and healthcare in the United States now, and what opportunities and challenges do these changes present for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation? I'm going to answer it in a little bit different way. I think we're at a, at a real inflection point in uh, health and healthcare. Uh, it is very clear that the health care system we have cannot be fixed with changes at the margin. It is so badly broken. We are investing an additional $100 billion a year than the previous year, and we're losing ground compared to other countries. They are simply getting healthier faster than we are. So we've got to find a different way to create health. And what we're starting to see, I think, so one of the key changes, is a much broader vision of what health is and where it comes from, so that it begins, is nurtured, is protected and preserved in our communities, and that the likelihood of initially becoming ill or injured is practically unrelated to good quality medical care. It is really about where uh, and uh, where one uh, lives, learns, works, and plays. The, the, um, whether one smokes, uh, how active a person is, uh, the food that they eat and how much of it, uh, the toxins or microbes they're exposed to in their home or their workplace, safety of a neighborhood, 
things that are all outside of medical care turn out to be the biggest drivers of health, especially of a community. That means we have to look elsewhere for improving our health than medical care like we have. The second, I think, is the recognition of, about how central uh, inequality is and disparity. Uh, in the lead up to this session, uh, Doug showed a, a, a graph that the mortality among workers uh, was fourfold difference uh, for those that were at the highest level positions versus those at the lower level position. What was missing from that graph was the mortality for those that were unemployed or uneducated came from dip, broken, difficult uh, families, which would have been even higher. We're seeing that in this country, we're seeing that grow such that income inequality is an area getting the attention, but make no mistake, that really affects uh, health of, of people, and we've got to capture and turn that around. We're seeing it in differences between communities. We're seeing it in differences uh, within uh, communities. Uh, but for example, if you don't know, uh, life expectancy among women has fallen in 43% of the counties in the U.S. in the last two decades. Who would have thought it? Who would have thought it? We are now, our life expectancy for uh, people uh, under age 50 is so bad that we are further from the second worst developed country than the second worst developed country is from the best. We, we have got to change where we think uh, health uh, comes from. So what does that mean for you? It means that as we work to create a culture of health in our communities, Businesses are starting to get it, so they're looking at where health care costs lower. How can they help a community become a healthier place? For example, VW built a new plant in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They went there not because of health. They went there because they got tax breaks and all of that. But they chose Ch Tennessee. They chose Chattanooga because it was among the healthiest places in that state. They built a 10,000-square-foot facility for their employees, decided to open it up to the community as a whole as a place to be, uh, be active. We're seeing more and more businesses include the healthiness of a community as one of the decision points in where to move. Civic leaders, mayors, and others are seeing this as the way to make a community an attractive place to attract business. Of course, the risk is that that makes a, an already disadvantaged community even more so. But if they don't know that this is what's happening, they won't be able to create the, the changes. So we see incredible opportunity opening up to both create and harness the, uh, what is necessary for our culture of health in our community um, because, in fact, uh, we're not able to do it within our medical care system. We've got to do it uh, uh, outside of uh, health care. Great. Thank you. So now we're going to go a little uh, broader. We're going to go international. So Carl, uh, tell us what you can about the dynamics. What's going on in the global health space? And because a lot of folks here are in the business of improving lives, where do we see or where do you see the opportunities to cut across uh, sectors and silos in, in this effort? Right. Well, thank you, Doug. And also thanks for your leadership in bringing this health stream to be part of SOCAP, which I think is very important. Global health is really about the 95% of health consumers that live outside the United States. And in terms of the work that my nonprofit does and others in our space, it's really looking at the two billion people or so around the world who are, uh, as you described a little bit in your opening discussion, you know, are saddled with a poor health situation, poor economic outlook, poor social outlook, are victims of underdevelopment, and are not going to escape that without some external assistance. You know, there's a lot of skepticism in the United States about what is often termed foreign aid or uh, foreign assistance. But you had a statistic in your opening comment there about what a difference 1% improvement would make in, in terms of the savings in what the U.S. spends on health care. And you know, that 1% represents more than the United States spends every year on every aspect of our engagement outside this country. Every aspect. Our diplomacy, 
our international development, our support for the UN, our support for international institutions, uh, not the military, but every civilian aspect of what we do. So, you know, this is often seen as a much greater proportion of our budget, but it's actually 1% of our federal budget. And it's achieved great things over the past several decades. Child mortality around the world has fallen dramatically. Um, HIV and AIDS are now, in many parts of the world, um, a manageable condition as opposed to a death sentence. And even family planning, family planning which has languished for a, too long, is now showing signs of progress in terms of meeting the unmet need for modern contraception that so many tens of millions of women around the world want. So there's tremendous progress that's occurred in global health. But there's also a lot of challenge right now. I mean, as we know as taxpayers, uh, public funding is constrained everywhere, not just in the United States, but everywhere around the world. And the disease burden is shifting. So even in the parts of Africa where we work, those blue areas on your map where life expectancy is lowest, what's expanding the fastest? Non-communicable disease, cancer, deaths from cancer. The burden is shifting in terms of the health, the health burden on the, poor, the poorest and most vulnerable in the world is shifting. And it's a time when we really need new partnerships uh, to try and address these challenges to create healthy communities, healthy societies, healthy countries. These are partnerships uh, that transcend public and private. They're partnerships that involve uh, developing country governments as well as donor governments. And organizations like mine, PSI, as well as other social marketing outfits, have for many decades been using private sector approaches uh, to reach these poor and vulnerable health consumers and help them make choices that allow them to live healthier lives. And we're using social marketing and social franchising uh, as tools to allow us to do that. So social marketing using private sector approaches, products and services um, to reach a target audience with a beneficial effect on the whole society. And social franchising using the private sector to leverage uh, that resource to reach the poorest and the vulnerable because they get, by the way, their health care from the private sector. So I would say there's a tremendous success in the global health space. It's a moment of transition, like Jim described in the domestic environment. It's a transition as well overseas, where new partnerships are really important, public and private, and particularly uh, investors who are looking for that social rate of return, that return on health investment that you talked about at the outset. Mm -hmm. Can you say another word, uh, just in terms of the scope? Uh, where where all is PSI working, sure. and and uh, what are the specific focuses? Sure. So we've been around for 43 years. We work in 65 countries around the world. We have about 9,000 employees. We, uh, through the largesse and the support of taxpayers in Europe and in the United States, and through the sale of products, uh, with annual revenue of about $550 million. And we are reaching tens of millions of health consumers every year and averting years of life that would have otherwise been lost to death or disease. So we use DALIs as our performance metric. Mm -hmm. Great, great. <clears throat> and actually, another panel later this week is going to talk about uh, the health return on investment, and specifically uh, a woman named Amy Ratcliffe is going to be talking about these DALIs, these disability-adjusted life years that PSI actually calculates and helps then determine where their investments go and, and, and measure what your success, which is a very, I mean, really we're, we're a nonprofit, but basically DALIs are our retained earnings. Right. That's what right. we're aiming for. All right, Tony. So the California Endowment, and this is your particular piece of the California Endowment, has a 10-year strategic plan to invest in 14 communities in California and the health of 14 communities. So what changes in health and health care recently and into the future are going to have the biggest impact on your work in these communities and your investment in these neighborhoods? Yeah, so um, first of all, I can't see anybody in the audience. These lights <laughs> are, are so bright. and. It's, it's really always important for me to see people's faces and their reactions to get a sense of whether they understand what the hell I'm saying. Um, so, so let me give you kind of a little bit of the bottom line of what um, 
what we're trying to do. Uh, first of all, just imagine this. Um, I have a dream job. It's, a, it's like an incredible job because somebody gave me a billion dollars and said, I want you to take this billion dollars and over the next 10 years in 14 low-income California communities, do whatever it takes to improve the health status of the populations in these places. And by the way, don't invest too much in healthcare because that has proven not to be all that effective. And so, so I get to wake up with and, 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 and work with a lot of other people with this idea that there's something that we can do um, with a, a relatively small amount of money. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot. I sometimes refer to it as our little bag of nickels. Uh, to figure out how to catalyze uh, health status changes in 14 underinvested communities throughout the state, from rural to urban, a um, couple of Native American reservations, uh, some uh, Central Valley farm communities. Uh, and we really don't have a textbook for doing this, which is why I'm you know, very delighted to be here and wish I could see your faces, because uh, you are actually quite critical to helping us figure out how to do a lot of this work. Now, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I, I grew up in Canada. I, I am a Canadian, and I'm proud of it. I'm also American. I'm proud of that, too. But, uh, <laughs> but here's the story. When I first came to this country, um, I was in the East Coast community in, uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. And, and was really quite shocked at the conditions in East Baltimore uh, where I was in medical school and, and couldn't understand what I was seeing and still to this day have a difficult time rationalizing it uh, and know for a fact that there are no communities in Canada that look like that. And one of the things that struck me was that people in this country kind of have a tolerance for conditions that in other parts of the world would be intolerable, certainly in developed countries. And when you're poor uh, in this country, that you pay an enormous social cost of being poor. If you're poor, you tend to live in a neighborhood where you have to worry about crime. You tend to live in housing that is you know, substandard, typically overcrowded, uh, full of, of triggers for disease, and um, is unstable. You tend to live in communities where there are poor schools. So, and I could go on. But everything is stacked against you. The social cost of poverty in this country is extreme. You can be poor in Canada and live in a neighborhood with great parks, great schools, uh, great housing. I went to university for free in Canada. Um, so the issues that are facing people's health trajectory in this country are structural and they are man-made. And so what we need to do in our work is to enlist your brilliant minds in figuring out how to undo some of these structural impediments to people's life trajectories. And we've recognized that that work requires a deep understanding and a deep investment in human capital. We have to figure out ways to harness the talents of people who live in these communities and enlist them in the crafting of 21st century solutions around health that will benefit all of us. And that's a, that's a fun job, let me just tell you. That's, that is just fun. Uh, what I, I think is typically not well understood is that health is really about opportunity. Health is about hope. Health is about having control over the future of your life. And to the extent that you lose that hope, that you lose that control, you tend to make much shorter term decisions. You're much more likely to smoke, you're much more likely to drink to excess, you're much more likely to drive without a seat belt, you're much more likely to have unprotected sex. All of those things are much more likely to occur in populations that feel they don't have control over their future. So our work is really, I tell my staff that you know, you're really hope salesmen. I mean, your goal is to really figure out ways to leverage the broader economy to actually invest in human capital and build hope. And that's why I'm excited to be here. I appreciate that. 
And I want to highlight, too, uh, that we do uh, this idea of the what we call platform communities. We have a session coming up later this week, if you're interested, specifically thinking about there's a, we have a, three or four different organizations that are working with communities, and how would entrepreneurs, investors work directly with these particular identified communities uh, to, to bring out the best of both sides. Kimberly. My question for you, so you represent Kresge, a national foundation that has not been traditionally a primary health, uh, health has not been a primary focus. So what role has your foundation taken to address the changing landscape of health and healthcare? And what can you tell us about some of the recent investments that Kresge has made in this health arena? So uh, I would say that Kresge, um, if you had to find an overall theme about the foundation, is really about community development. And my job at the foundation is somewhat unusual in that I'm not a grant maker. I was brought to figure out how to build a financing practice inside the foundation that would complement the strategies um, that the foundation had prioritized. And one of the kind of low-hanging fruit um, that, uh, that seemed ready when I was um, trying to get my feet on the ground was the grant making that we were doing uh, to federally qualified healthcare centers. Healthcare centers that had a revenue stream and it occurred to me that there was an opportunity to use debt to build those uh, new healthcare centers rather than to use grants. And some of that had been going on through CDFIs, particularly NCB Capital Impact, um, but it wasn't really at scale. And so that was kind of the, the first starting place for us. But as, and I was not a health person, I really came from the housing world. But as I've learned more about health and its uh, relationship to community development, health to me seems really kind of like the super vitamin for community development, if you will. Because through better health outcomes, you can get better educational outcomes, you get better employment outcomes, you get better earnings, which result in more tax dollars. And so I think the challenge that the foundation is trying to figure out is how do we not just isolate health within one program area, but how do we think about how health is really knitted into everything that we do? So we really started out with a very simple strategy of trying to push debt uh, into the CDFI market and build an understanding about how that debt might build uh, new federally qualified healthcare centers. And I think with several excellent partners, we've had some early success there. But I think the next and higher challenge for us is to really figure out not just how do we build more boxes of healthcare facilities, but how do we really influence what happens inside those boxes, not just on health outcomes, but also on cost and care efficiency. And probably maybe the third rung uh, that we haven't gotten to yet is really how do we move uh, other systems of community development to prioritize, measure, and find metrics for, uh, for the way that they can interact with health. Somebody said to me the other day at a meeting that I think we were at together, you know, like the American Association of Architects was calling, looking for standards, like how should they be thinking about health? which sounds like, I don't know, a little puzzling to me, but I think that's really the frontier that we need to get to and the aspiration, which is that it's not an isolated group of the believers, which we all are, but really it's different, many different constituencies thinking about how health can be a part of their work on a day-to-day -day basis. Did you want to mention any particular example of the, uh, oh. She's maybe got to adjust here. Okay. Did you want to mention um, the Healthy Future Fund specifically, or any any sort of uh, uh, one of the names of the uh, the investments recently? Yeah, Just sure. To so give we, a, an um, we have done a number of uh, debt investments through CDFIs. We did uh, an interesting fund last year that was called the Healthy Futures Fund. That was a partnership with Lisk and Morgan Stanley 
which was a $100 million fund that used low-income housing tax credits and new market tax credits. It was kind of bifurcated in two pieces. The new markets was about building uh, new health centers, and the low-income housing credits was uh, directed at projects that have health services embedded in them. I really think that's like a 1.0 version of where I hope we can go, because this is really about having a visiting nurse come to come to a housing uh, development. It's about a van service that takes people down to uh, a clinic. That's really only that's the beginning of where we need to go. But there is this large chasm that exists between housers and health providers and health providers and other service providers. And some of those, and I think it's been a role that the foundation has played, is just helping people to get to know one another. Because, I mean, we all know that we transact business better with people that we know. And it's been shocking to me. I'll tell you a funny story. So when I was trying to figure out the whole healthcare landscape, I went to a developer a friend of mine that I knew really well. And they owned uh, a home healthcare business. And I said, Tom, you know, what do you you guys do with FQHCs? And he goes, FQ what? And I said, FQHCs. And he was like, FQ what? And I federally qualified healthcare centers. He goes, oh, he goes, uh, all, all our patients, all our, our tenants, um, they're covered under Medicaid. And I said, I know, but where do they go? I mean, you're housing 50,000 people. And he goes, you know what? We really don't know. And I mean, it's just an example of even the most sophisticated among the housing developers um, up until this point perhaps haven't had a full understanding of, um, of where their patients are going. Probably our, uh, our most recent investment, which I'm really pleased about, is with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. This is uh, an organization based in Denver that is not just a housing developer, but also an operator in FQHC. We've recently done a line of credit to that organization to allow them to expand their health services in, uh, in advance of um, health care reform. We did that, uh, that line of credit based on performance. So we set an interest rate on it, but that interest rate is going to decrease as the health uh, outcomes of their tenants improve. And so we feel like it's a way, as a social investor, that we can drive an organization uh, to a greater, um, uh, a, a greater level of impact that they want to achieve and really monetize that uh, in terms of a, 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 a discount that they will mm -hmm. benefit from. Yeah, the reason I like those examples is because it's carrots, not sticks. It's offering money that if you set your system up in a certain way, you'll get access to. And in the case of lowering interest rates by meeting certain uh, thresholds, <clears throat> that's exciting too, because again, the opportunity for entrepreneurial activity to help these organizations meet these thresholds. What are those things? Is it, is it, is it a bus service to get them around? Is it, uh, you know, is it the uh, having folks visit them in their home? We don't entirely know, and that's partly where, why we're here, because smart people are going to think of the things we haven't thought of yet. All right. So, David Erickson, Federal Reserve Bank, sitting here on a health panel at SOCAP. Uh, it's kind of a strange thing. Uh, I will, though, to save you a little bit, uh, I, the Federal Reserve has partnered uh, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation now for three years on the Healthy Communities Initiative, which was really focused on bringing together community development and public health and to try to help uh, uh, increase the integration uh, across those sectors. But can you tell us a little more about what is the Federal Reserve's interest in healthy communities, sure. and how does that interest align with SOCAP, which brings you here to being on this panel? Sure. Thanks, Thanks Doug. Um, yeah, I, I'm starting to get a little bit of a complex, because every time I go to a conference and I say I'm from the Federal Reserve, everyone says, why are you here? <laughs> you know, like that sort of, and uh, so let me see if I can explain that a little bit. Um, you know, the Federal Reserve gets a lot of headlines um, for setting monetary policy, but uh, it, it, we also are bank regulators, so um, one of the one of the uh, laws that we enforce um, and help with our two other sister regulators um, is the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, which requires banks to lend back into the communities where they take deposits, and and this is a pretty sizable. Um, 
amount of money that goes into these communities. And um, if, if the, for those of you who aren't familiar with community development, this is really an industry that came out of the war on poverty. Um, it focuses, over the years it has sort of morphed, it was kind of economic development, community empowerment, it sort of is morphed over time to focus more on building this sort of community amenities that would make a, a, a neighborhood more viable. So, um, and, and, and the, the, the subsidies that go into this are, are in the neighborhood of about $20 billion a year. The workhorse here is affordable housing development um, that's usually service enriched. So either it's for frail elderly or you know um, single parents or people who are formerly homeless, people like that, 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 that need some services in addition to their housing. They, uh, community developers also build clinics, schools, grocery stores and food deserts, a lot of these other amenities. But if you talk to someone like um, Nancy Andrews, who runs the Low Income Investment Fund, she said, you know, we really thought that if we got the buildings right, we'd solve all the problems. You know, we could somehow just build our way out of this problem. We could build our way out of poverty. We'd, re we'd reintegrate these neighborhoods back into the mainstream. And if we look at the, the statistics, we see that we're not, we're not making as much of an impact as we hoped we would. So um, poverty is still going up. Even the number of people who are ill housed is still going up. And so we thought, okay, we need, we need, we need more partners, right? We need to think differently about this. And so, that's when we really started looking at some of the work that Robert Wood Johnson had done with their commission to build a healthier America, where they really had hit this, I think, just uh, world-changing insight, which is that your zip code is more important than your genetic code for your health. And, uh, and you think about that. Like, you think of all the times you filled out a form where you say, this is, you know, is there uh, heart disease in your family? Is there a history of cancer? None of that is as significant as your zip code. Like, how crazy is that? So I, that's when we started thinking, well, wait, we're in the zip code improving business. So let's get your friends together, our friends, and we've got a party, you know? And, um, but what, what we find is, and, and part of the reason why, uh, to get to the question or what the title of the panel, what's, what does this mean for investors and entrepreneurs, th this changing landscape of health? I think what's happening with this merger of health and community development is creating a new type of a platform that's going to provide a lot of opportunity for social enterprises to come in and for investors to come in to make investments that have a social return to make a lot of money. So let me just repeat that. I think there is a chance to make a lot of money because <laughs> there is a disruption going on right now that is so profound uh, where increasingly that money, that $2.8 trillion that Doug talked about before, that's currently mostly going to pay for procedures, is soon going to go to people who can keep people healthy. I cannot tell you how important that change in, in, in focus is. It's going to require an entire new set of skills, new enterprises, new institutions, and new investment vehicles like the Healthy Futures Fund that are going to allow investors to come anywhere along the risk-return spectrum to, to, and, and, and achieve some type of social return uh, in their investing. So this is something I, I've been coming to SOCAP every year since it started. Um, and uh, I always enjoy my conversations with Kevin after a couple glasses of wine. I very rarely understand what he says until it takes me about a year to catch up to what he's, what he's talking about. But he was today at the Federal Reserve talking about um, all of these different entrepreneurs that are using uh, cell phone apps, or smartphone apps, or um, case, really interesting use of case managed technology and bath mats that can help case managers manage people's type 2 diabetes. So you start seeing how these entrepreneurs are glomming together with community developers and those who care about improving the health, health of low-income Americans with this changing landscape with uh, pay for value in, in, in the healthcare system. You can see why we have David on the panel. He's a very uh, positive thinker. Um, you actually started to answer one of the questions I wanted to ask the panel, uh, getting to it. So one of the questions we discussed is the term you've used it before, David, actually. The, the Federal Reserve actually held a meeting earlier today uh, in alignment with SOCAP, focusing on community development, health, impact investing, and social entrepreneurship all mixed together in a room at the Federal Reserve Bank, which is kind of exciting. But we talked about the health imp impact economy. So the question we'd 
talked about. And so if each of you maybe thinks just for a minute or two or, or, or talks for just a minute or two, in order to create or move forward a health impact economy, who are the partners we need to have? And how do the types of entrepreneurs and innovators and investors that attend meeting, this meeting fit into that calculus and also specifically for your own institution moving forward? Maybe I'll start, uh, Doug. The way I see it is that there's almost no sector that doesn't have an influence on health. But most... Oop. Yes. Can oh, there you hear we go. me? There we okay. go. There go. Sorry, I have no control over it. <laughs> uh, there's almost no sector that doesn't have a real influence on health. But most of the time, they haven't assessed that. They haven't used that to... Uh, uh, Mon they haven't monetized it, say, what's the cash flow or who gets the, be the benefit from that? And we have a lot of interventions that are aimed at reducing the cost of illness, but very little about capturing the value for health. And that's one of the things that you out there looking at, how do you improve health, and then how do you find the funding streams that benefit from that mm -hmm. is what we need. But it is, it, it, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in transportation, even in uh, uh, schools. Uh, and so when you look at community development, it's not just about housing, but it is about, is there a supermarket there? Supermarket that brings jobs. We know better jobs need to better the health. Uh, supermarket that brings uh, fresh fruit and vegetables that even people of low income will buy more fresh fruits and vegetables if it's easy for them uh, uh, to do so. About a, uh, a, an, a FQHC, a neighborhood health center that can provide uh, uh, quality uh, care and perhaps help them get to other services they need. In fact, one of the, the areas where there's really good evidence is that um, if you build housing and then build services into it, connect it to it, so that the residents who have their struggles can get those services, service-enhanced housing, they do better. They do better for longer, their families do better, and it is an added value for very little additional marginal cost to the housing. That's an area that's well-known, well-studied. So I think it's, it's, there are opportunities there but we just have got to harness them and understand how do we get the value for health and turn that into the, the, uh, the monetary flows that uh, mm -hmm. um, you all will uh, use <laughs> and, and your banker says there's a lot of money for it. Yeah. <laughs> to, a profit to be made. <laughs> and so Carl, on the global stage, what's... Well, I would say, you know, we're, we're, we like to think of ourselves as in the health impact business. This mm -hmm. is our core business. Um, and I, I think... In the global health space, um, one of the perils is that uh, this fantastic you know, technological innovation that you talked about, David, and the interesting ways in which new entrepreneurs are coming into the space, it's often assumed that that's the real obstacle that needs to be overcome when you talk about the two billion people that we are potentially working with. And although all of those things are crucially important, um, I think the reality is in our space, really what you need is partnership with people who are just core process improvers. Hmm. We are not looking for the new silver bullet. Many of the interventions already exist. The low cost, simple interventions exist to save people's lives. It is simply a matter of getting it into their hands or getting them to the facility or getting, um, you know, getting the supply chain to work better. You know, we, we, for instance, with funding from a foundation, we do a lot of work with male circumcision, adult voluntary medical male circumcision as an HIV prevention tool in Southern Africa. And um, ensuring that we could get the maximum impact among men who wanted that service was really what? It was a process improvement question. It was how do we get the right services and the right commodities with the demand creation in the right places? And these are not highly, I mean, this is, this is a many thousand year old business we're talking about. Not great technological intervention, innovation here. So what, a lot of what happens in the global health space depends on simply making what seems boring better. Mm -hmm. and faster. Mm -hmm. And that's how we save more lives in that space. Yeah, it's uh, maybe because I've spent 
many hours thinking about content for this week, but I'm going to plug another panel related to that. But that, that issue is really critical, and I wanted to make sure that here at this meeting that we don't think that tech technology is always the solution. That here in the US as well, there are systems changes, by sort of what I think of as people-oriented changes. We're going to have a group called Health Leads speaking later this week. Uh, it's called Beyond the App is the name of the panel, talking about how you actually allow a physician to identify, like I talked about earlier, a housing problem, writing a prescription, giving it to the patient or the family. They go to the front desk, and someone there is trained and has the resources to actually connect them with housing resources, something that I can't do as a physician, but they can do. That, that's, a, that's a Google, that's simply having an iPhone, practically. It's not, it's not the technology of it, it's having a person there to really help close uh, as a case manager, which is what's missing. Right. Tony, any thoughts about partners uh, with the California Endowment and how, uh, what the opportunities are there, or what you need? Yeah, uh, so, you know, when, when you go through public health training, you learn these obscure terms, like the social determinants of health, which basically just means the social causes of health. And you learn very quickly that the two most important ones are income and education. Everything else is basically derivative of income and education in this country. And if you talk about income in this country, changing income, redistributing income, you know, everybody brands you a socialist and chases you out of the room. Um, so you can talk about education, um, and people basically will give you a hearing. Now, when we're, uh, I'm not focused on individual health. I'm focused on the health of communities, which is really about the structures and opportunities within a community that allow people to pursue opportunity. Um, and when you map uh, in this state, in this region, uh, those communities that have the lowest life expectancy, you also see that those are the communities that have the least physical accessibility to opportunity. Mm -hmm. And opportunity defined as basically employment um, or uh, education pathways that allow you to access employment. In fact, a recent study just looked at um, essentially low opportunity communities and high opportunity communities and the fact that people can pursue social mobility more effectively in high opportunity communities than they can in low opportunity communities. So for me and my colleagues who are struggling to try to figure out ways to improve the overall health status of communities, the partners that we're looking for are the ones that can help connect a higher percentage of people, well, this thing's going to blow down, isn't it? Uh, a higher percentage of people in these low opportunity communities with opportunity. And when you think about many of these communities, you don't have to think about it, you can just look at the sort of the data, um, you see that the things like the official unemployment rate may be as high as 30, 40 percent. And you know that those people that are counted as unemployed are surviving. Well, how are they surviving? They're operating in an informal economy. They may be going to flea markets and purchasing stuff and reselling them. They may be fixing stuff uh, in their garages. They may be running a hair salon in their garage. And so we recognize that it's important to actually facilitate people's participation in that economy as well, because as they become more successful in that, as their income rises, their health rises their health improves, they have much more access to opportunity. So folks that can help potentiate or facilitate connectivity for people operating in the in informal economy, microloans, you know, all kinds of uh, technological applications for bringing people together so they can access markets more efficiently, that's actually health improvement strategy uh, mm -hmm. at the local level. So we're very interested in hearing from, um, you know, meaningfully designed strategies to help connect people, uh, to make them more uh, productive uh, in the segment of the economy where they're most likely to access. Yeah, that's really great. I want to note the time. We've got just about 10 minutes left. Uh, Kimberly and David, any uh, quick comments? And then I want to see if we can get a question or two. 
been having mm -hmm. some very interesting conversations with insurers who um, have a business reason to uh, look at different strategies around wellness, uh, preventing readmissions. And so uh, we've been looking at some nascent partnerships between service providers, between housers, about how those entities, uh, because they are touching people where they live and have uh, a trusted relationship, can actually um, both be in a business relationship, so perhaps earn some economic value, but really try and, it's kind of an unlikely suspect that we haven't worked with uh, before, but I think reaching across those lines, there's new mm -hmm. partners to be found. You know, that's really great. Any comments? Just, um, just really quickly, the, um, one thing I forgot to mention is that I am speaking for myself and not the Federal Reserve, so that's, <laughs> because I'm reminded of that, because the next thing I was gonna say is that I think the status quo, my, my mantra lately is that it's unfair, dumb, and expensive. You know, and it's, and it's, we spend a lot of money, but on the wrong things. Prisons, uh, emergency room visits, um, special education classes for kids that are, are so expensive, it's more expensive than the whole other class, a whole classroom, you know. Mm -hmm. So we can readjust how we spend money, but that's gonna take system change. And that's, everyone on this panel has talked about system change and how important that is. One thing I'm gonna see if I can do this in like a minute and a half, mm -hmm. but you know, everyone thinks about the Marshall Plan as being this great opportunity to, to sort of, uh, this um, uh, altruistic rebuilding of the European economy. But there really was, one of the theories behind it was, you know, we've, got, we've come to Europe twice in a short amount of time to end the war between all these countries. And, and, and the condition for participating in the Marshall Plan was you had to build, everyone had national industries. There was a Belgian steel industry, there was a German steel industry, there was a French steel industry. And then in order to participate in the Marshall Plan, which is only about 3% of the European GDP, so not that much money, you had to say, okay, we're using German coal and French iron ore and we're gonna build it in Belgian steel mills. And we're gonna reorganize the European economy on a continental-wide basis on the theory that they won't go to war together again if they're connected ec economically, mm -hmm. right? And so you have uh, what became the, the, uh, the, the, the coal and iron ore league that became the common market that became the EU, right? So these small changes, small amounts of incentives can really change systems. I think foundations need to lead the way in how they can create the prototypes that show the way, and then I think government needs to come in behind them and start changing the systems and, and policy. And that, those, that, I think, then we can start seeing, then there's gonna be a rich opportunity for entrepreneurs and investors to fill in the gaps and fill out that new economy. Great, thank you. See a historian, we had to get a little history in. Uh, yes, why don't we see if we have time for a couple questions. Uh, try to keep them short and question-oriented, not long uh, statements if we can. We've got one right back here. Hi. Oh, well, yeah, hey, um, I have a, um, a really uh, innovative uh, strategy for public health and um, uh, we've been uh, researched by Arizona State and some other things. Um, but one of the things we uh, discovered was that the medical community has a certain set of metrics uh, to say what success is. Are investors using the same metrics uh, as the medical community for, met, uh, for what success is to what they fund? Because uh, if they did, it feels like no one would fund anything because it feels like the medical community, especially the public health, has a strict criteria. Yeah. Anyone want to try that one, Jim? Um, I, I think one of the things we've found as we've started to come together with community development is that, in fact, there are different metrics or at least different ways of framing them. And we've got to find a way to build those bridges. Um, one of the things I talked about is that we know about the prevention of the cost of illness, but we've not talked about the value of health enhancement as a, as a way we've got to start to structure our dialogues and understand what each other uh, brings uh, to it. So for example, a community development uh, work that uh, creates a park uh, likely will create uh, increased activity, uh, places for people to play, if, if presuming that they're safe. That's not measured or counted as a health investment by medical care. And so under the Affordable Care Act, they no longer can count um, the, the clinical care uh, that is uh, charitable. They've got to look for other investments. So that's another potential source of funding, but it also, I hope, 
uh, will be one of those small changes that leads to the health care system being able to say, what are the investments in our community that will help health overall? But we're not there yet, but it's a place where I think there's a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. The difference, too, between outcomes and output. So just the number of patients you see in your clinic is not as important as whether any of them actually got better. And the same is true for housing. You can build lots of housing, but if it's not quality housing, you have, you've sort of defeated the purpose. So we had a question here. Oh, there we go, in yellow. Hi, I'm Anders Ferguson, and I'm one of your moderators yes. <laughs> and one of the panels, Doug. Thank you. Thank you all. I've come to learn something so I can be an intelligent moderator. So I think you've, you guys have collectively made the argument that health isn't health care. And you made the effective argument that um, the zip code determines our health and that it's all going in the wrong direction. And thanks to our Canadian American, we know that America doesn't care about poverty and poor people. Like, so the missing link that I don't understand out of all this is how are you going to change that to change health care if we don't care about poverty and poor people? historically or today, yeah. and collectively as a nation, we're getting poor, and so everybody in the food chain is fighting to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Yeah, so, so thanks for that question. Um, and it's, it's something we think about all the time, you know, how do we get people to care about this? But, you know, there's sort of two answers to that question. One is that, and if you look back historically in this country, you know, the historian could probably do a better job of this, um, you know, people didn't care about civil rights. People didn't care about HIV AIDS. People didn't care about gay marriage. I mean, people didn't care about disability. Um, but they were made to care um, by building the power of people who recognize this as a priority issue. So part of our work is to essentially, and I, I say this very openly, health is political. You actually have to build social, political, and economic power in a critical mass of people in the communities that are most impacted by these outcomes so that they can actually take hold of the reins and change some of the priorities in those communities. I mean, that's really important. But the second piece that I think is, in part, what I'm hearing a little bit when I hear about the Federal Reserve's interest and, and, and some of the non-traditional health players' interest in this is that we are heading down a path just with chronic disease that is bankrupting local government, bankrupting state government, bankrupting the federal government, bankrupting the private sector. I mean, when you see people go on strike, it's typically not wages that they're arguing about. It's like, who pays for health care? So, you know, there's all of a sudden all of this aligned interest and concern around this problem uh, about escalating, spiraling, spiraling health care costs. And you can't get to a solution in the healthcare delivery system for that problem. You have to get outside the doors of the healthcare delivery system and look at community, look at community infrastructure, and redesign the healthcare system as fully integrated in, in the community. And so that's a challenge for all of us. It's not just the health of poor people that's uh, at issue here, it's the health of all of us. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll like oh, go ahead. Try add a little bit. So what we're seeing here and, and I hope that you are, you're entrepreneurs. We think that there's market opportunity in this area. Right. When we looked at in the area of obesity, the companies, the food processing food companies that did the best, had the best stock market performance, the best reputation, the best profitability, were those that were increasing the proportion of their product offerings that were better for you. So you don't have to do this only as a social good. There is market opportunity. Some of it may not be at market rates, but we think that there's a lot of opportunity uh, uh, there. The other is, frankly, like, uh, like Tony said, there, we need a movement where health is a shared social goal. And then we say, we look to our decisions made in our various sectors and say, does it help health? If not, what does it take to add to health? Uh, and how costly is that for that added health benefit. But we've got to make that much more a conscious set of discussion and decisions. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add one thing too. When Kevin Jones, who's one of the founders of SOCAP, spoke at the Federal Reserve Bank earlier today, he put it very bluntly and said, when the market sees that money can be made on poor people, meaning the delta, the change in health 
the largest savings will be in those who are worst off. That will move money in a new direction. And I think that was a fascinating and very different perspective than I would have as a physician and a, and a public health professional. But that's one of the main reasons we're here. So we've got one last question, I believe, back here. And then we'll wrap up. Hi, my name is Maria May. I'm from BRAC, based in Bangladesh. Um, my question to the panelists was that I feel that a lot of what I'm hearing is really refreshing to hear in the domestic context, but it's uh, the approach that we've been using in global health for a long time. <laughs> and so I wondered kind of what strategies you're using to learn from what's happened globally, particularly in developing countries, and how you're planning to apply that here. Thank you. That's a very good question. One, one of the things that's interesting about the, 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 the next generation of community health centers is really based on a South African model from the, before the apartheid government. It was the work of John Castle, where he basically said, we were gonna, the clinic will adopt the whole neighborhood as its patient. You know? And I think this is really important, that the ideas about how we make these changes should stop at the border, that we need to sort of be borrowing from other countries to get, to, to get the best ideas possible to make these changes. Yeah, Jim, or, or Tony, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would, first of all, great question. Thank you very much for that question. We think about that a lot in our work, and it, it, if we had more time, we could talk a, a little bit about historically how the U.S. has tried to influence global health thinking to try to kind of narrow the spectrum of, of what are the real determinants of health. Um, the U.S. is behind the rest of the world in terms of understanding what actually drives health which is why we tend to invest so much in this damage control kind of system. Um, but what we've learned from looking at other countries, both developed and undeveloped countries, is that this whole notion of sort of structural change, you know, looking at trying to make critical multi-sectoral investments usually early on in the, in the life trajectories of, of humans, um, tend to have much better ROI than the things that are later and narrow. Any last comments, I, I Jim or Kimberly? Just, uh, a little bit to that. Uh, at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we have opportunistically, or uh, we've, we've found ideas and applied them in the U.S. or found uh, uh, entrepreneurs who've done that. Uh, for example, treating violence as a transmissible condition. Mm -hmm. How do you interrupt it? Uh, much like you do directly observed uh, therapy, you apply it uh, in ways to, uh, to stop the, the spread. Or early detection of uh, mental illness, something that came from Scandinavia, mental illness in uh, adolescence, where treatment is much more effective if uh, found early. We are a domestically focused foundation, but we've just made the decision that we're going to be much more systematic about looking for uh, uh, ideas uh, elsewhere that we can try to uh, apply here. And it may be the foundations who can lead in this space, because when you talk about mobilizing federal dollars, that prevention versus uh, treatment problem that you cite, you know, the only place where you get the political consensus to mobilize the resources for all the investments in global health is around the treatment conversation, and prevention is always an uphill struggle. Mm -hmm. It's always an uphill struggle. Kimberly, any last word? No, nope, I think that'll do it. All right, good. Well, thank you all. We ran over a little, but I want to thank our panel, thank and thank you all for participating. <laughs> and enjoy the week. I hope you like the sessions. <laughs>